You're listening to the Struck Podcast. I'm Dan Blewett. I'm Alan Hall. And here on Struck, we talk about everything aviation, aerospace engineering, and lightning protection. All right, welcome back to the Struck Podcast. On today's episode, first in our new segment, we're going to chat about Honda opening up a new wing facility. Second, Virgin Orbit finally getting up into orbit, which is exciting. Uh, in our engineering segment, we're going to talk about SpaceX trying to catch their rockets on the way down, which is fascinating and sounds just crazy. But then again, what isn't about uh, space travel? Uh, and then we're also going to talk about uh, wall LEDs and private jets. It's an interesting new technology report out the the Rob report. And um, just wondering if that changes design and if that's going to have any negative uh, drawbacks. Lastly, in our EVTOL segment, we'll talk about Volocopter, uh, a couple new designs, um, from Manta and also from MetroHop, which is a electric, uh, it's a short takeoff, um, not necessarily a vertical takeoff. So Alan, first let's start with Honda. So they're opening up a new facility. You're a big Honda fan. Um, you like their engineering tactics. They're, you know, they've sort of revolutionized painting their aircraft, but this is a wing mm. facility here. And, uh, what sticks out to you at this, uh, 83,000 square foot facility that they're bringing to North Carolina? Well, I think they've reached critical mass in a sense. When you open another facility to build wings, that means you're having a pretty good production run. And the part of the facility is also to uh, handle spare parts. And I think they have about 170 aircraft in service right now. So you're starting to get that need of servicing a lot of aircraft in a lot of different places. And you need to have spare parts on hand to get them out the door relatively quickly to get the airplanes back in service. So they needed to have that parts supply center essentially on site so they can manage that. Because uh, most of the aircraft companies, when they get to a certain size, will start to to, to do that. So it's a really good sign that Honda One thinks their production is going to continue at some reasonable rate. And two, it gets them uh, more room to, to build wings because they had, they were building wings already in the existing factory, but this gives them a lot more space to do it and building a lot more wings concurrently. And then having the parts distributorship is even better. So it just looks for, even though we're in the middle of COVID right now, Honda is playing the long game. It's been playing the long game for a while. And I think it's a good positive sign for, for Honda, the Honda Jet, and, and North Carolina because it's it's a big facility in North Carolina. They probably put 200 plus, 300 plus million dollars down in North Carolina at this point, plus salaries. It's a big deal. So I have a question, and I think this gets overlooked because one of the things that I find the most fascinating about the, the production of anything is production lines Mm. and some of these factories and some of these facilities like this one i'm looking at these photos of of honda it's like who designed like the first bottling plant these are tremendous machines i mean they don't get you know they never reach the public eye hardly but when you see you know coca-cola being bottled back in the in the 20s just flying through the assembly line these machines are incredibly complex and they're incredibly precise and they don't break all that often right right um you know so when honda's making a new facility and we talked about you know uh bombardier's wing facility do you is it within their company like does honda have their own set of engineers that's designing the facility not just the facility but also just the the tools in it and the the processes and the and the dollies and the things that you're going to clamp a wing onto and wheel it around like those things are incredibly complex, as complex as probably a lot of the aircraft parts themselves. How does how does that all work? Well, the, usually there's a separate group that'll do that. Now, I don't know if Honda has that the the engineering group within their facilities that does that. Sometimes it's, it's outsourced. I remember when I worked at Beach, there was some tooling done inside and some of it done outside, depending on what the application was. But it's a whole it's a whole line of business. It's, it's a whole set of engineering skills that differs from other things, uh, like building an airplane. Because mm-hmm. building an airplane is about lightweight, keeping the cost down, all those little little bits and pieces. When you're designing a factory floor, you're making things out of steel, and you're making it such that you can keep the like if you're, like the wing build structure is something that is very accurately designed because you don't want to build in a twist or deformation into the wing. So all those little fixtures that you have to build are really complicated. And sometimes it's done on site with the aircraft designers or sometimes it's done off site, but essentially all those, all the, the uh, mechanical tooling, fixturing, 
all those bits and bobs to know that it, it goes from you know, fixture A to fixture B to fixture C as you're building the wing and constructing it are really highly engineered pieces of equipment that no one really considers. And one, they're expensive, and two, there's just a lot of engineering time that goes into those things, right? Because you want to repeatedly use this tool and get accurate results out of it. So it's a whole industrial engineering uh, approach that gets overlooked a lot of times, but it, it's probably one of the most yeah. important things in terms of consistency of the product, right? If you have bad tooling, you have a bad product. It just mm-hmm. comes hand in hand. And so um, the people that do that uh, are kind of a special breed because it, it, there's a lot that goes into it. Well, yeah, it would seem really difficult, especially being like an outside group to come in and, and just like say, okay, all right, you know, yeah, we specialize in, in building out these facilities and tools and all this stuff. Mm. So tell us what you're building. That seems like a really long process to figure out, Oh yes. you know, all the components that they're building and, and how they build them and to then sit down and say, okay, well, here's step one, here's step two. <laughs> it just makes my yeah. brain hurt. It's just a super impressive thing. So yeah, you're right. Cause I think you're right because it also depends on how many you intend to shove out the door, how many, how many wings you tend to shove out the door. That's, changes, that's also true. That changes mm-hmm. the way you design the fixturing, right? And how, and is it like in the case of some of the Boeing, uh, Boeing lines where it, it went from a sort of a station approach where aircraft in station one that moves to station two and the station three to the aircraft saw a move, always moving approach, which is similar to what would happen in Detroit when they're making automobiles, where the assembly line is always moving constantly and you're putting the parts on as the, as the car's moving down the line. They were doing that or they have done that at Boeing where the, the production line is continuously moving and you, you're putting parts on the aircraft as it's moving down the line. Honda's not going to do that because the quantities aren't that high, I don't think. So it's going to be more of a station approach, but it does change the way you design all that tooling and fixturing is is based on how much you're going to shove out the door. And I, I know at times uh, when they've had large increases in production at some of these aircraft companies, what do you do? You, you're sort of built into this uh, mindset or system of typically station builds and then if you have to double that production essentially you, what you need to do is build another facility and build the same set setup you already have to increase production you can't jam or into the system without re- completely redesigning the system and spending a lot of money to redesign it so you kind of have one shot at it and you kind of know what your production rate maximums and minimums are going to be and you design the tooling around that max and min yeah that's a just like I said, it's like a whole other thing mm. beyond just the complexity of the plane or the automobile or the Coca-Cola bottle itself. So it's just yeah. mind blowing stuff. So let's talk about Virgin. Uh, so Virgin Orbit, it's launcher one rocket has finally made it into space. So Alan, this is a big day. Obviously, SpaceX yeah. has done this. Um, where do you see Virgin Orbit fitting into this sort of uh into the big players, obviously they're one of the bigger players with Blue Blue uh, Blue Origin and SpaceX. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is exciting for them. How do you feel about it? Well, it, it's similar to technology that uh, Orbital Sciences was doing probably mid two thousands, uh, where they had a, I think it was an MD eleven. They were dropping uh, payloads off on these rockets that are mounted to the bottom of an. I think it was an MD eleven, maybe a DC ten or uh, L ten eleven, but. Um, essentially, the, th- the thought process of the Virgin setup is it's on a 747 platform, but you're basically taking the you're, you're pulling up the smallest rocket on the bottom of the 747. You're taking it through most of the atmosphere, which reduces the amount of fuel burn you need on the rocket, so it can make the rocket smaller. And you drop this rocket off the the aircraft, and then it shoots itself up into space and for smaller payloads, it makes a lot of sense because it's a lower cost alternative uh, to a disposable rocket, if you think of it that way. If you if you start with the concept of all rockets are disposable on one shot events, like it used to be five years ago, uh, uh, putting it on an aircraft reduces the overall cost to launch, particularly things that are not going that high up in orbit. So uh, the Virgin effort was sort of an outgrowth of what had already occurred previously occurred, but maybe in a more efficient manner. The problem right now is the cost, that cost versus the SpaceX cost. You got to wonder if the SpaceX approach of reusable rockets is going to over, overcome the Virgin effort. Because Virgin's got two things going on in parallel, right? They have the, the Virgin Orbit and the Virgin Galactic. And the Galactic is the human launch, right? That's the shoot yourself into space, look outside the window, 
uh, efforts going down in New Mexico. Then you got the orbit, which is more about satellite launches. So Virgin's got two things going on parallel. Uh, I wonder if they're in a pinch right now. I wonder if Virgin's in a pinch because of how fast SpaceX has gone on and launched people into orbit to the space station and how, how quickly they are able to launch small spacecraft into orbit also the SpaceX and, and on a reusable platform. So the, the costs are going down and the insurance costs have gone down for SpaceX because they demonstrated that they can reuse the rocket and they just don't lose a lot of those spacecraft. So um, I wonder if Virgin's kind of in a pinch here, even though it's, it's a great success and I, I can't wait till Virgin Galactic gets going. Um, you know, technology wise, you kind of wonder if Virgin's gonna be in trouble here. All right, so in our, our uh, engineering segment today, first thing we're going to talk about is an uh, interesting article out of robreport.com. Uh, this eco-friendly business jet is using essentially floor-to-ceiling, not quite floor-to-ceiling, but panoramic wall OLED screens <laughs> to project uh, essentially the environment. So if you're flying in this private jet, which is extremely nice, um, you know you could be looking out into what appears to be the horizon. It appears to be a forest. It appears to be whatever I guess you want it to be. Um, and this is an interesting concept because we talked about some planes in the past, like the Solera 500L was one of them where they had really small windows because of their aerodynamic design. And obviously passengers want to be able to look out the window and you can feel pretty claustrophobic being in a small tube, especially with private jets being, business jets being, you know, lower, um, you know, floor to ceiling heights. So, Alan, is this something that's going to catch on? I mean, would we ever see this, do you think, in a commercial airliner in the future? I don't know. You know, Boeing did a, a, a number of, of uh, ex experiments on, on aircraft lighting. And in fact, they've incorporated some of those into their newer aircraft where they can change the... Yeah, that sky, that le that like sky blue light that leaks yeah. in. Like, I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and they know there's some calming effect to the color of light, right? That... Uh, doesn't blue light help keep you awake? Isn't that one of the things or keep your attention? There's a lot of, yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of misconceptions about blue light. Those blue light glasses are essentially like snake oil from what I've heard. Um, <laughs> listen to actual optometrists, people that actually know the eyes. Um, but anyway, I, dig I digress. But yeah, the blue light's great. Yeah, so there's 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 a lot of uh, things you can do with lighting now, most because of the LEDs and, and you can change color mm -hmm. with LEDs and it's it's cool technology. So there's been a lot of things in the, and even aircraft are flying today, which they can change the colors in the cockpit and the cabin and do all these wonderful, neat things. The, the need for passenger windows has always been <laughs> one of those pinch points because it's a, it changes the way the structure is and it adds weight to the aircraft to put windows in. Uh, it's not so much a drag thing as it is just extra weight because anywhere you put an opening in a pressurized tube, you're going to have to reinforce that opening. And therefore, there's additional weight that goes along with that. Plus, the windows themselves are not necessarily structural, but they, they need to be inspected. And there's... I think there's two. There's usually two layers. There's an outer one and then an inner. Inner. So you're not. You're not actually. If you're sitting on a 737, you're tapping on the little plastic window. You're not actually tap. You're not actually tapping to the outside world. There's a little plastic window there, and there's this one on the outside, which is actually in the airflow. So there's like two pieces there that always have to be maintained. And when aircraft are converted to freighters, the first thing to do is they rip out all those windows and put in aluminum plugs, so they don't have to deal with the windows and inspecting the windows and the, and the weight of the windows. So. The, the windows are, are only there for passenger purposes to look outside mm -hmm. and make everybody calm. Uh, but if you had some system that would project an outside image, that would be pretty cool. And the, the way that this little article talks about projecting basically any image would be like, uh, uh, what's the big, Th what's the big movie theaters IMAX? It'd be like an, it'd be being in a, like being in an IMAX mm -hmm. almost, and then the, the, and I always think, well, that's cool. I mean, I would like that, but people get motion sick, don't like that <laughs> because yeah. what your eyes see and what your inner ear are detecting, uh, if they're if they're getting two different signals, like I'm stationary, but my inner ear is saying that I'm moving, that's where seasickness comes from <laughs> very quickly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, I guess you could watch movies. I mean, you could display movies on the side of the airplane. Um, but what would I, you know, if it's an effort to get, way, get, get rid of the windows, I think there's a positive for that. If it makes everybody seasick <laughs> or motion sick, then it's probably a negative aspect. So they're going to have to weigh that out. And I also think one of the things about 
putting any sort of electronic technology within reach of passengers is that it's going to get damaged. And maybe the business jet market is less susceptible to that. Uh, but on a A320, there's just too many fingers, too many little kids <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. banging on stuff that it would probably break it, which would defeat the whole purpose of it. So there's, it's got some neat technology. I, I do think we're going to see the elimination of Windows coming up pretty soon in the next 15, 20 years. And I'm going to think you're going to see screens and cameras there to simulate the outside world or to take images of it and display it instead of having the windows. I think that'll happen, but it's going to take time for people to adjust to that. Yeah, agreed. So let's go back to SpaceX. So they're trying to launch or there's, they're trying to tower catch um, their heavy rockets. Um, so Alan, what does this actually mean? Because I think for people who aren't familiar with with this idea of catching a rocket it's it's a little bit foreign to them yeah, it's pretty much foreign to everybody at this point yeah because we've seen the the falcon 9 design where the there's legs sort of built into the side of the rocket and as the rocket gets close to its landing site those legs pop out and provide a platform to stabilize the rocket and then it lands but you're carrying the, the negative side of that is that you're carrying this weight and which you use for a fraction of the flight. Just the last 30 seconds do you need those those landing gear. So if you can eliminate the landing gear, you could add more payload or use less fuel, one or the other, uh, to get the rocket into orbit. So if you could catch the rocket via like on the uh, some of the newer SpaceX spacecraft, if people are watching some of those things, it's got those those fins, those fins in the, near the top. Uh, if you could catch this this the rocket with those fins, then you wouldn't need the landing gear. Mm-hmm. It, it it does make sense, but it really increases the uh, accuracy and the control system, so that you have to bring that rocket within a really tight, narrow window to get that system to work. Right now, with the the little feet mechanism, I'd say they're probably plus or minus 50 feet from dead center uh, when they land when they land the Falcon 9s like that. And if you have some sort of that's going to grab onto it, it's got to be within feet, like a couple of feet, you'd have to think. So your accuracy of of your guidance systems has to go way up and maybe they already have that technology and they figure they can do it but there's it would take a little bit of time but i understand that the need and the desire to reduce unnecessary weight and there is some complexity to that landing gear feet system even though it has been pretty reliable i haven't seen the dan have you seen the the landing gear system fail i haven't no no i haven't seen one of those gear collapse yet i've seen what they missed and Rock. I guess it's the rocks that have tipped over some of the early ones, but uh, lately, no. So you, you got to wonder if it's just a <laughs> Elon Musk. Hey, this is a way to save a thousand pounds on this rocket. Get rid of this, all this, all this feet. Let's try it. You got nothing to lose. Let's see what happens. And if they can get it to work, they get it to work. If not, not. And they're back to the system they know works, which is the feet. All right, moving on to our EVTOL segment today. First, we're going to chat a little bit about Volocopter. So they've, they're have they making a move towards U.S., uh, urban air mobility. Um, so, Alan, it says that their their ac- application was accepted by the FAA on mm-hmm. uh, the 22nd of December and uh, to concurrently validate the YASA type certification that they hope to get in the next two to three years. So what does this step move? You're our, our certification guru. What, is this, what does this mean for, uh, for Volocopter? You have to go two down two two separate pathways, but essentially the ASA has one set of rules and the FAA has another set of rules, and they're trying to normalize or standardize those rules between the two. I think that's where they're going, is to say EASA wants this rule and the FAA wants that rule. Well, how do we satisfy both as inexpensive and simplistically as we can? And so that now that they're addressing it up front, I think it's it's a smarter way to go about it. The FAA is not adding additional rules and they're not writing new rules based on these these smaller um, uniquely designed aircraft. What they're doing is they're taking the existing rules and applying them particular to that installation or that design. Very similar to what the FAA had done years ago for the 
Bell 609, which is now Augusta Westland, which is now Leonardo. 609 tilt rotor design, which was at the time a very uh, unique aircraft in that it had rotated the, the it had propellers at the end of the wing that, that tilted up and down. And it's very similar to the V-22, but the, F, the FAA hadn't certified the V-22, the military had. So uh, the FAA went through this process of basically picking and choosing regulations to apply to that specific design. So they pick them out of different uh, regulatory buckets. So they use the small aircraft for some, the small rotorcraft for some other regulations, and they kind of combine them into this big list of here's your compliance checklist you have to, to demonstrate compliance with. Volocopter is doing the same thing. They're trying to create that compliance checklist. Here's the list of things that we have to go do and then figure out where the differences lie, identify those differences, and try to address them earlier rather than later. And I think that makes a lot of sense because the volocopter design is pretty far down the pathway. I haven't seen any significant changes to their base aircraft design. It looks like it's pretty well stabilized, and all they want to do now is show that it's airworthy, which is a good place to be. If you feel like you got a, a relatively robust system and your systems engineers have, have demonstrated, if I lose a particular electric motor, it doesn't matter. Uh, if I have uh, you know, some sort of computer upset, I can still fly the aircraft to where it needs to go. All those little safety things that are, are probably have been done by them. So at this point, it's really just going down and demonstrating that the that the aircraft will meet the FAA and EASA regulations, which is a good place to be. That's probably a two to three year process, typically, um, and probably a two hundred to three hundred million dollar event. But it's it's doable, and I think Volocopter's got a pretty good shot <laughs> compared to some other designs we have seen recently. Yeah, so speaking of other designs, so uh, we've got a new one here. Uh, Manta, which is a Swiss company, has two potential designs, the ANN1, which is a single seat, and the ANN2, uh, it's a double seat. And they're actually, they can vertically take off and also do a short runway takeoff. The shore is 100 yards. Of course, these are just renderings. They do not exist yet. Right. Um, but these look like, they look like fighter jets. <laughs> and they're powered by four ducted electric fans. And they potentially can get to 186 mile per hour cruising speed with a range of nearly 400 miles. Um, Alan, how do you feel? How, how do you feel about this design? I don't think it's going anywhere based on where the other eVTOL designs are at today. If you take a look at the Joby, the heavy side, the Volocopter, all those designs do not use ducted fans. And I think there's a mm -hmm. reason for that because there's there's transition issues as you go from vertical flight to horizontal flight. There's if you're rotating these ducted fans or have something that um, you have these weird aerodynamic effects that happen as you're moving forward where you're not producing the thrust you think you're going to be producing and then the ducted part goes away. So I'm surprising mm -hmm. there's a lot of ducted fans still around because even NASA's not doing that. I mean, everybody has seen to make the jump to basically it's a propeller moving air, nothing else around it. It's a simple design. The only one that's still kind of in that mode is really Lilium. Uh, but they're using a lot smaller, a lot smaller fans, I'll call them. I guess they're kind of ducted fans in a sense, but there's 35 or 36 of these little little motors. So it's weird to see a design that looks like it's five years old, honestly. Um, you'd think you'd take a look around and see what everybody else is doing that's in flight test because the flight test, will, the flight test doesn't lie. <laughs> Essentially, uh, you see you see changes in design only because flight test forces you that way. Even, even beta, which is up in and New York right now doing flight tests doesn't use any ducted fans. So anytime I see a new ducted fan design pop out, I think, wow, that's just so old. It's so 1990. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what yeah. it seems like, right? It's like, ah, no, 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 no. There's something fundamentally wrong with it. Yeah, well, and your, your thing has always been that complexity, like the more complex it looks and the more off the beaten path it looks, I mean, the percentage, this is just not going to work financially or otherwise, it just skyrockets. I mean, that's been your thing is like, stop deviating so far from a what's come before and now what the front runners are doing. And I think that's one of your central points that makes a lot of sense. Like this looks nothing like any of the front runners. Right. And it looks a lot like a fighter jet and it has ducted fans, which no one uses. It's like all that stuff should add up, but it doesn't seem to for some companies. No, I, I think the PR overtakes the reality sometimes that it 
it does play like a lot of aircraft programs over my lifetime, where there'd be a big splash of PR, some really cool renderings of what this aircraft in theory is going to look like, and they shop it to see if they can get funding. And when they get funding, they sort of get start going down that process of trying to build the thing. If they don't get funding, so what? They just spent some money on some renderings. That's what it feels like. So unless there's, they can attract a huge investor, and I'm a huge investor, I'm talking about hundred plus million dollars investor, then it, it'll never come to fruition in these type of things. It, because the only way these small aircraft are going to make the money they need to stay afloat is they got to sell literally thousands of these and then probably be also participating in the in the marketplace like uber does like every flight you're going to take a percentage of if mm-hmm. you're not doing that and it's pointless really is pointless so our last design we have another new design to talk about today is from metro hop and this one's interesting because they're not a, a vertical takeoff and landing they're a short takeoff and landing so they believe they can uh, besides Covering 125 mile radius at a 250 mile per hour cruising speed, this little aircraft um, only needs 82 feet, is what they're saying, of runway, which could make rooftop runways a thing. Alan, how do you feel about rooftop runways? I think they're an awful idea. <laughs> they're just an awful, awful idea. Because it's just too much risk with the very little reward. The risk is that on a rooftop, if you were going to take off and had some sort of problem, what's the likely outcome? Well, you're going to run into something or somebody and do a lot of damage on the ground. The reason the airports are not necessarily near big uh, industrialized centers is because of the consequence of the aircraft not making it off the runway properly. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's why a lot the, the vast majority of airports are not located in highly populated areas. So putting an aircraft takeoff and landing inside a highly populated area doesn't even make any sense. Why do it? Um, yeah, but a short takeoff, a short takeoff on a, on a, on a smaller strip in a, you know, in a, in a rural environment, it does make a lot of sense. And in, in that, um, it opens up a lot of the plate, a lot of smaller pieces of property. You could have a, have a takeoff, a landing spot. Like if I'm in Kansas, let's just pick Kansas. Cause I like Kansas. So if you're in Kansas, there's a, there's a, there's already a lot of runways out there. You'd be surprised how many mm-hmm. runways are. I think around Wichita, there's like six or eight different runways you can get in and out of. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it does make it personal on some sense uh, because you, you wouldn't need to put down that much asphalt, which is, is the benefit too. And, and there is some benefit. Um, I do think there's a benefit to having a shorter takeoff and shorter landing. In a lot of places like up in Alaska, it's a benefit to have that because the the takeoff and landing spots are relatively short. They're between two mountains. So you need to have a short takeoff and short landing, short landing aircraft, which would make a lot of sense. But I just, Dan, I, I'm not going to fly to my local pizza shop and land on top of the pizza roof. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense to me. And even the Lake Tahoe thing. So let's just talk about Lake Tahoe. So Lake Tahoe is a very um, exclusive place nowadays for a lot of the Silicon Valley uh, glitterati to travel to and have homes up around Lake Tahoe. And Lake Tahoe is beautiful, by the way. Uh, but there's an airport right next to it. So why couldn't you just land at the airport and take the five minute drive from the airport to your multi-million dollar home on the edge of Lake Tahoe, why do you have to land at your home? I just, that doesn't make any sense to me. The, the, the downside risk is so enormous that the short takeoff things though are cool. I, I got to admit, uh, sort of this, this aircraft has like a leaping feature where it, it wants to basically bounce up in the air. Yeah, that's pretty cool. If it, if it shortens the takeoff time and I could put it on a smaller piece of property, awesome. But I just don't think flying towards a populated area makes any sense none well yeah i mean you skid off the runway one time and then you crash down to the street below and yeah i mean terrible terrible consequences yeah well one thing that they do mention in this article uh is that the company plans to first you know potentially do piloted cargo uh versions of the plane and uh could potentially transport goods from hospitals and stuff like that so it seems like Someone there has got an idea that, hey, this is probably not like, you know, but, you know, landing on rooftop city mode first. Like, let's see how we can utilize this short runway model and, you know, get vaccines or, you know, get organs and, you know, get 
maybe potentially even people. I don't know about that, but just, you know, cargo from, you know, in, in places where it's like, hey, can you get this over here in 20 minutes? Like, we really need this this liver to tr for, for a patient. That makes a lot of sense. And uh, that's kind of been like my thing is like we should a lot of these things should be tested probably commercially first. You know, just take your EVTOL from the shore to the cargo rig and back. Bring, you know, prove the model that way first and then figure out the viability and then see, well, maybe we can apply this to consumer. And it seems like they're they're thinking about that, which I think is good. Yeah, I do think the, the cargo approach has a lot of benefits to it to, one, figure out the technology, see where it can be used, and two, there's just less risk in it on the, on the company side because you don't, it's not full of people. Um, and, and that's where the Alaska thing, I think, is interesting because if you ever watch shows of – and there's actually companies that deliver to remote parts of Alaska, and those runways are icy or they're short or they're between mountains and all that kind of fun stuff. If you, if you could open up access to a lot of different places where there is civilization and they, people need – a short takeoff and landing aircraft and it and it's electric and it's available and it's just a faster means of transport less expensive means of transport which it will be then there's a huge opportunity there that seems to get overlooked because everybody's still thinking they're going to go from their apartment roof to some restaurant roof that's just not going to happen all right well that'll do it for today's episode of struck if you're new to the show, thank you so much for listening and please leave a review and subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Check out the WeatherGuard Lightning Tech YouTube channel for video episodes, full interviews, and short clips from the show. And follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Our handle is at WG Lightning. Tune in next Tuesday for another great episode on aviation, aerospace engineering, and lightning protection. Strike Tape, WeatherGuard Lightning Tech's proprietary lightning protection for radomes, provides unmatched durability for years to come. If you need help with your radome lightning protection, reach out to us at weatherguardaero.com. That's weatherguardaero.com.